So today we are on the way to Pantheon, one of the most emblematic buildings of Paris. We are going to visit the actual Pantheon and also we're going to take you a little bit higher than that. Let's go and see it. On the night of August 7 to 8, 1744, Louis XV fell very ill while traveling to Metz. Thinking he was about to die, he relied on God and made a vow if he healed to build a sumptuous monument to the glory of Saint Genevieve, Saint Patron of Paris, to replace the old, very degraded church. He healed on August 25th and he kept his promise. So I'm quite excited today because I've been trying to come here for a long time and we were waiting for the panorama kind of like a they make it sound like it's really high, but it's not high, and they usually keep it closed. It's just the second floor, like at the bottom of the cupola, where we're gonna go up. And uh, I was really excited to come here today. I still am. <laughs> um, because the weather is also a little bit nicer than I expected, so let's see. The king went on a pilgrimage to the abbey located on the Saint Genevieve mountain. He then promised the religious the reconstruction of their very old church dedicated for nearly a thousand years to Saint Genevieve. On September 6, 1764, almost 20 years later, the first stone was laid by the king himself. The king chose Jacques Germain Soufflot, a young architect then little known. Initially, he opted for a Greek cross plan covered by a triple dome. However, he eventually had to change the plan to the Latin cross, a preferred shape of religious building than in France. Soufflot died in 1780 without having completed his work exhausted by the work and the controversies generated by his architecture. At the same time as the work on the church, he undertook the breakthrough of the current Soufflo Street, as well as the construction of the Faculty of Law, to which a twin was given in 1844, the Marie of the 5th arrondissement we see today. It was his collaborator Maximilien Brébillon and his student Jean-Baptiste Rondolet who took over and completed the project in 1790. Upon Mirabeau's death in April 1791, the Constituent Assembly decided to transform the Saint Genevieve Church into a tomb of the great men of the French Republic, who had distinguished themselves by their talents, virtues, and services rendered to this country. This was the birth of the Pantheon. The building oscillated between these two functions throughout the 19th century. Over the course of changes in political regimes, the function of the building has evolved no less than six times. Voltaire and Rousseau entered the Pantheon in 1791 and 1794, respectively. So over here you've got Rousseau and you've got Voltaire on the other side. And they were the two people who were some of the first ones to be placed in here, to be buried here. Now the ironic part is that they really didn't like each other, but now they're facing each other for eternity. Shortly after, in 1806, Napoleon Bonaparte returned the building to the Catholic Church, but kept the crypt to bury the dignitaries of the empire. The crypt itself is a somber, yet historically fascinating place to visit. Today the Pantheon is best known for its most famous personalities, such as Victor Hugo, Voltaire, Marie Curie or Jean Moulin. The most recent Pantheonization was that of Josephine Baker in November 2021. us like 10 minutes to climb up we will be having panoramic view of Paris so let's see it together from 1790 to 1889 the date of construction of Eiffel Tower the Pantheon was the highest point in Paris. It seems like the roof of Notre Dame is coming up. From the panorama one can appreciate the importance of Pantheon's geographic location in the city. Aside from the 360 degree view of Paris, it is also possible to observe the location of the ancient abbey that Louis XV visited in 1744. Today it is the Lycée Henri IV. It occupies the building of the former Saint-Geneviève Abbey. 
not only do you have the amazing view of Paris, but you also can relax here <laughs> a little bit. They don't rush you around and it gives you time to really soak in the view and uh, appreciate the beautiful architecture of the city. In 1815, under the restoration, the monument became in its entirety a church again, before resuming its function as Pantheon in 1830 under the July monarchy. Named Temple of Humanity in 1848 under the Second Republic, the building became a church again with the advent of the Second Empire in December 1851. It wasn't until Victor Hugo's funeral in 1885, under the Third Republic, that the monument definitively kept its status as Pantheon. Fun fact, originally the tomb of the unknown soldier was to rest in the Pantheon. After the First World War, it was proposed that a tomb be erected in honor of an anonymous soldier. The Pantheon was chosen, but veterans associations requested a unique and symbolic place. The Arc de Triomphe was eventually chosen. Léon Foucault was an astronomer and a physicist who invented the gyroscope. It was in his private home that he performed the experiment for the first time to see the Earth turn. Napoleon III authorized Léon Foucault, along with the engineer Gustave Fromont, to use the dome of the Pantheon to conduct their experiment. They hang from the center of the dome a steel wire 67 meters long and a sphere of 28 kilograms. A wood and sand device were installed under the pendulum to visualize Foucault's explanations at each passage. Today, there is a transparent table and a ring around the pendulum with minute markings. It must be noted that it takes 32 hours for the pendulum to make full circle. Reason for that is the Earth's curvature. You would only get 24 hours tour at the north or south poles of our planet. This was the first time ever for anyone to show the turning of the Earth without looking at the stars. Evidently, it was a great success. And within a year, over 150 pendulums were installed all over the world. Through this experiment, Foucault explained, if we launch in the same axis a pendulum attached to a fixed point and we realize over the hours that its oscillation deviates from its initial trajectory, we can conclude that it is not the pendulum itself that moves, but its attachment point. The Pantheon being immobile, its initial point of attachment is indeed the Earth. As you can see, the pendulum definitely progresses clockwise in party. If you were in the southern hemisphere, it would move counterclockwise. At the equator, it wouldn't move at all. It truly is a fascinating experience to witness in person. So if you look at the walls of the Pantheon, you will see there are a lot of rectangles that seem like they have been filled in. The reason for that, those are actually windows. Initially, the church was supposed to be much brighter, according to the original design of the architect, and it was supposed to have much more light and, uh, you know, just create a feeling of airness of the building, just like you would normally find in any churches. But after the revolution, they decided to fill them in. So the idea was to create the sense of somberness inside the building, and that's why they filled in the windows. There is a little problem though, slight problem is that once they filled in the windows the building became much more humid so they had to sort it out they had to find the ways to combat this humidity i really like the pendulum and the paintings on the wall and of course if you want to come early you have to book your tickets in advance otherwise you will have to queue for hours and then at the end they may say oh tickets are over there is no more ticket and especially for panorama because when we came here they put a sign saying the tickets sold out, you have to come back later, tomorrow or the other day. So just to avoid this, you should check the website. We will put a link below so you can just go directly to the website. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like this kind of content, subscribe, like and comment under the video. And uh, until the next one, au revoir.